and welcome everyone. So I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Tao Shi as our distinguished speaker today. So he is a professor and Willett Faculty Scholar in the Department of Computer Science at Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And Dr. Shi is an uh, SEM distinguished speaker and among his many awards that he has received, uh, he has been SEM distinguished scientist and more recently he received the very prestigious IEEE Fellow Award. And his research interests are in software engineering, software testing, analysis. And today, he is going to talk about uh, his recent, uh, recent research and future directions in the field of intelligent software engineering. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Tao Shi. Thanks a lot for having me over here uh, to share um, some of the research results, not just my own, but also uh, research results from the research community in these uh, interdisciplinary areas in between uh, AI and software engineering. Uh, I named these uh, areas intelligent software engineering. Um, particularly, uh, we are talking about two directions, right? Um, how we can use uh, AI technologies, or in general, uh, intelligent solutions to help address uh, different tasks or different problems in software engineering. That's the top part, right? Intelligent software engineering, which I speak the intelligent and software engineering. The second direction uh, is on like uh, using software engineering solutions, techniques, or process to help um, like uh, build um, higher quality. Uh, AI solution or intelligent solutions with higher quality. As you can see here, we put intelligent and software together. And for those who pay attention to the wording, uh, you will see I change intelligent to be intelligence. Uh, because typically, if you say software is intelligent, we are more thinking about, oh, it's a self adaptive, I mean, that kind of a sense. Here, we're particularly talking about software being use for this kind of like uh, uh, AI or machine learning and, and this kind of like uh, uh, um, software solutions uh, for, for intelligence. Um, so um, as we know, I mean, AI software uh, would be still software, right? Of course, nowadays we have AI chip, right? I mean, AI hardware to realize the, 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 the functionality of AI. But uh, if you use software to realize uh, AI, then you have software then software engineering naturally would come into the pictures. So I'm going to talk about uh, some example problems uh, um, along with some sample solutions in these two directions. Now let's look at the first direction, intelligence software engineering. How, we, how can we make uh, those solutions for software engineering tasks to be more intelligent? Sometimes we like AI techniques or machine learning techniques, but sometimes not necessary, right? Maybe using program synthesis and advanced program analysis te uh, techniques to make our solution more intelligent. So before I, I dive into uh, what we normally would say being intelligent in our solution, I would just uh, walk through some of the solutions that people uh, have already uh, say as intelligence in a more uh, gen like a, 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 a general way, right? And, and really speaking, they are not exactly that intelligent. So this is a, a DAPA a Cyber Grand Challenge uh, back in 2016. Uh, basically, they set up these uh, competitions, right? You put up a vulnerable system, more like a web, uh, 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 like an application. And, and uh, so that you could attack other people's vulnerable system at the same time, defending against other people's attack your, of your vulnerable system. Right? So they require some kind of like on-the-fly patching and, and defense, uh, all about automation, right? using your tools without human in the loop. So in the end, this uh, uh, particular system from Carnegie Mellon's uh, like a startup uh, uh, company called Mayhem actually uh, uh, took the, the top price uh, for like uh, two million US dollars. Okay. 
um, the, in the news media, they say, oh, right, that's AI, right? I mean, like, already automatically, without human in the loop, we could actually defend and our vulnerable system and also can attack other people's vulnerable systems at the same time. Second day, uh, like uh, such top uh, price system participated in the human normal the competition, like for hackers, right? Uh, in a similar setting. Uh, due to some actually uh, misconfigurations, right? The human configuration, because the, even it's uh, AI uh, solutions, you still need some human configuration, and in the end, uh, the, the Mayhem 2 was uh, ranked last, right? So uh, that comes with good news for many researchers, right? Which means that if we are working on these kind of like testing analysis tools, I mean, we still have a long way to go, right? And, and, uh, and we really shouldn't just be so, so panicked and, and saying like, uh, 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 like the AI would take over and replace us. But let's see what exactly this uh, Mayhem 2 is doing. Actually, uh, the technology uh, uh, was looted from a technique called dynamic symbol solution or concurrent testing uh, being proposed around like year 2004 or 2005 in the software engineering area and programming language uh, 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 communities. Um, so the idea is really simple. I just quickly walk through it uh, because I don't have a lot of technical uh, stuff in my slide this is the only one I think with the code on the slides and uh, just have a little bit fun here. So as you can see, the left hand side we have a very simple program, right? And uh, have a three if statements, a second and third are nested if statements, and then the last uh, branch of the if statement, the true branch, would be just throw exception. Um, our goal here is to find out a test input to cause the execution of that last branch so that we could throw exception, right? Uh, as a human, when we look at this very simple lines of code, we could say, oh yeah, I mean, obvious, uh, you, you could just pass in uh, integer array with uh, like uh, at least one element and with the first element being that very, very large number, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, zero, right? And, and then we could reach the last branch. Um, now let's see how dynamic simple execution can automatically find this, this input to trigger the last branch or all the feasible branches in the program. Right? Um, so uh, of course, I mean, like uh, if like you have very very long program with so many logics in between before you want to reach certain execution point, it's very difficult for human to reason about what kind of inputs you will come up with. Then in such occasion, dynamic simulation or automatic tool support would play its advantage to outperform human. But for illustration purpose here, I just use a very simple program. So dynamic simulation will start with uh, like a, a default input or random input. Right? Let's use non-pointer as an input for integer array type, which is a, a input type for this very simple program. Dynamic simulation will first instrument the program itself or the execution environment so that we could collect which branching points the execution of the input would go through. And in addition, it will also collect the constraints on the input values in order to force the execution to go through exactly the path that we observe for that particular concrete execution, okay. uh, serving these uh, like two purposes. Now, after we execute this non-pointer, as you can see, immediately in the if statement, first if statement, we just return, return right, as a true branch. And for this very simple path, we collect the constraints on the input level. Uh, so A equal to non pointer, basically, we just collect the branching points, the predicates there. And if the predicates would be derived from the input value, we replace the re expression of that variable with the expression for the input uh, variables. So that our constraint would be at the input level, not like inside the, 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 uh, the body of the program. Okay, next, after we get the constraint, we pick a branching point in the path that we just executed, and then we flip it. What do we mean flip it? It's like we pick a middle part of the path, we throw all the constraints that we collect after that point, and then we negate this constraint that we just flip, and then we conjunct it, like end, with the earlier constraint we collect in the past prefix. 
for our very simple program, we just simply flip all, all the time, the last branch, but in reality, we could flip any point in the program execution. So we just flip the last uh, branch, which is actually just a, only one branch in the past, A, not, A equal to null pointer, now we flip it, negate it, we get A not equal to null pointer. Then we fit such new constraint to a constraint solver. Uh, we use like uh, Microsoft Research Z3, which is a well-known constraint solver, state of the art and state of the practice. The constraint solver would give you an input value to satisfy the constraint that we already got after flipping the last branch. Then uh, it's empty, as you can see, not safe for that. Yeah, the, the integer array, not even non pointer Yeah, of course, I mean, empty integer array, right? That would serve the purpose. Then we further execute this new input. Now we see we reach the second if statement and the fourth branch. We collect the constraint A not equal to non pointer coming from the first if statement. And then the second if statement, we had the constraint a dot length not greater than zero, right? Because now a dot length is zero. Right? So similarly, we flip one of the branch uh, or branching points, and now we fit the last one, uh, a dot length greater than zero. Right? Basically, forcing our array to have at least one element. Then we fit this constraint to constraint solver. We get one very simple integer array with one element. This element's value is zero. We further execute this new input value. Now we finally reach the last branching point. Because our first element is zero, not that big number. Therefore, we have the not equal to that big number, A0, the first element of the array. Similarly, we flip the last branch. Now we force the uh, A0 to be that big number. We fit into a conjunct solver. Conjunct solver give you this big number due to the space. I, I did not list all the numbers here, but basically it is the number to allow us to reach the last branch uh, the, of the, the sole inception. And then we execute it, uh, we see we crash the program, so inception, then we are done. It happened for this very simple program. We ex exhausted, uh, exhaustively enumerate all possible paths or explore all the paths. Right? So that's how dynamic simple execution could allow you to generate input to cover different portion of the, the program. But the, the uh, like reality is not that simple, right? As you can see, in order to really use such techniques in practice for large program, we face some difficulties. Uh, as you could imagine, this technique basically explores all feasible execution paths of the program. If I have 20 if statements in parallel, how many paths you could have? Whose power was 20, right? Even very simple program. Uh, you have so many paths to, to explore. So it's, a, it's a basically in dynamic simple execution, one very important uh, like a technique or the, in, in the whole process is on deciding which branching point you want to flip, basically, which path or which branch you want to take priority for you to explore first, given the limited time allocated for testing. So that's how some of the so-called intelligent techniques are coming to the picture, uh, including uh, some of the techniques that I developed with, uh, in collaboration with Microsoft Research, uh, called Fitness, uh, uh, published in DSN uh, 2009 paper. If you're interested, you could take a look at it. Basically, the idea is to take this fitness function idea from the like, evolutionary algorithm, right, genetic algorithm, and then measure how close it is for us to get into uh, covering certain branch that we have not covered yet. And then we kind of systematically guide the search using such a feedback. Right? So that's a project uh, uh, like uh, on PEX, which is a simple execution engine for .NET, like C Sharp, Visual Basic, and F Sharp. Uh, what can we stand actually like uh, more than 10 years? And, and finally, uh, like uh, uh, in 2015, uh, the PEX 2 was shipped with uh, View Studio 2015 Enterprise Edition with a new name, IntelliTest. Okay? Uh, although, like, uh, I mean, maybe not all many different techniques have, are so intelligent, but, but uh, Microsoft put the, the intelligent uh, as a prefix of the new features here. Of course, for the more recent View Studio 2017 Enterprise Edition, it also has this feature. Right? So, uh, so that's uh, one example, like, how this kind of like, uh, 
intelligent techniques, including some ideas from uh, evolution and algorithm, could help us in, in helping this uh, test generation based on dynamic simulation. Besides the high level news media on the, the, the like the DARPA cyber competition, right? and then people just say, oh, whoa, it's, it's AI magic there. So in the past two years, actually close to three years, uh, we started some research with uh, uh, Tencent, which is a major IT company uh, uh, in China, uh, producing uh, a super popular app called WeChat. Right? And I think probably some of you have the WeChat uh, on your mobile phone. Uh, so it uh, actually has active monthly users, uh, 1 billion users uh, around the world, uh, although like it may not reach the number of users like Facebook and other popular apps uh, in the US, but uh, think about WeChat would be primarily uh, uh, like the use by people from China or with the origin uh, uh, of China like myself, right, currently in the US. So it's still a huge number of users. It's not just a single simple messaging app, right? Initially it was started as a messaging app, more like WhatsApp, right? But now just like almost everything, right? It just like uh, more like Facebook, you could like have some friend circle to make posts, share information with friends. You can also even pay, like PayPal. You pay your friends with certain money you love for them. You could change for money, more like banking, right? You like on the street, like vendor, like on, on the street in, in China, uh, different cities. Like these vendors, I mean, not so high end, right? They still use WeChat to charge, I mean, the items you buy on the street. Right? It's a super popular, pervasive use. So we, we basically collaborated with them on improving the quality of uh, such app. Right? Uh, within our knowledge, that was uh, more like first major attempt, uh, like research attempt in the, the community for really focus on such a huge app. Right? Of course, I mean, nowadays, I, we have one slide to talk about, like, I mean, Facebook along with other companies are also putting efforts in this automatic text generation tools for Android apps or mobile apps in general. Some statistics, as you can see here, like for the WeChat app, that's like from a couple years ago statistic, the number of executable Java source files, uh, Java code lines would be more than 600,000. Okay. So we did some improvement over Monkey for uh, allowing such tool to have high effectiveness and high efficiency on, on like WeChat, such a very large app. So as I mentioned, Facebook uh, actually uh, it's, uh, it's uh, also making great progress in this uh, direction, automatic uh, Android app or mobile app test generation. Uh, they actually, uh, they actually acquired a startup company co-founded by uh, uh, Mark Harmon, a professor at UCL at, at UK, uh, along uh, with uh, his uh, former PhD students. Uh, and then they developed these, uh, uh, these two called Sapiens. Right, being initially as a startup with some corresponding open source version uh, being publicly available and then Facebook further improved such tool to scale up to a lot of these uh, like uh, different apps and in their daily operation or testing uh, uh, of the, 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 the popular apps being used by so many people. So we've seen more and more like uh, these kind of industry practice on pushing along this direction. One thing I want to mention is that Sapiens uh, is, is based on search-based test generation, as I mentioned, using this evolution algorithm, genetic algorithm, to help evolve the generated test in a better uh, like effectiveness. So after uh, like, uh, we worked on such uh, Android app test generation tools along with others, right? one question we asked is like, okay, uh, yes, we made some progress, like for our collaboration, we focus on uh, WeChat, right? And, and Facebook, uh, after acquiring the startup company, they focus on like, uh, like Facebook Messenger or Facebook app. But if you look at the research communities, right? Of course, I mean, it's very natural to start with uh, uh, open source applications, like many other sub areas of testing and analysis, right? Because I mean, they give us a lot of uh, convenience, right? Because you could do debugging, you could file bug reports, you could communicate with the open source developers, you could make code commits, you could provide patch. Um, but could we really generalize the result for an open source apps to this industry app? What I say, industry apps, it's like those highly popular use apps. 
Of course, some open source apps are also highly popular use, right? And, and in some other domain, for example, the Hadoop and other data analytics systems, I mean, directly these open source systems would be used in industry, right? So I think we need to look at different domains to see whether we could generalize it. But our question here is like, okay, well, let's look at different tools, different papers being published. Here we list only a sample of them, right? Mm -hmm. But normally we carry out evaluations on comparing your tool against other tools, like here I'm talking about automated text generation for Android, right? On, on, on the open source project, open source apps. And a few of them uh, actually like uh, carry out case study on some like uh, industry app, but, but they don't compare across different tools on the industry app. So we started some efforts actually carrying out these two comparison and see could we actually observe the advantage of the state of the art tools over monkey, right, which is a random text generator tool, um, and on industry apps as we observe on the open source apps. Uh, actually, open source apps several years back, uh, we uh, like a researcher from Georgia Tech also reported results saying that all these at that time, uh, like these uh, research tools cannot outperform. Monkey, which is a random generation tool. So we did some, some, some study. Uh, I'm not going to really tell you the results, right? But the highlight is that, uh, yeah, I mean, Monkey is still actually pretty good, okay? Uh, at least, I mean, uh, among this uh, industry app, because as you could imagine, uh, a lot of these very complex app have this kind of messaging, right? I mean, uh, like even payment, I mean, all different kind of these features normally we don't see in the open source apps, okay? So the high-level message is that uh, uh, we are pushing on giving more intelligence into these different tools. Um, um, we would like to encourage the research community to really look at these industry apps, not just open source apps, to find out more opportunities to allow your intelligence sol solutions to actually show the advantage, right? If like, relatively simple open source apps, you don't need intelligence, right? Random tethering tool may already give you good enough. So that's something I think to, for our community to think about uh, besides working on open source apps. So what do we mean intelligence? As I said earlier, we use different names, IntelliTest, or saying using evolutionary algorithm, that would be intelligence. One part of the, the characteristic that I consider as a real intelligence would be continuous learning. Right? So if you look around for different tools, like soft engine tools, particular testing analysis tools, Often the time we just apply the tool and then we reapply another, uh, another application or another software system. The memory or history of applying on the tool on the earlier system will be gone, right? They, they don't have the memory, keep them getting better and better. So that's why I say continuous learning. So when you apply the tool, your tool should be, become smarter and smarter and more intelligent. Uh, a lot of time we don't have that characteristics in our tools. I think this is a very general direction that many of our researchers, two researchers, just think about. Some kind of like a, some taste of this kind of like a research result reflected this continuous learning, right? For the constraint solving, as I mentioned, as an underlying engine for the, uh, for, for, for symbol execution, uh, um, it's expensive to trigger the constraint solver to solve the constraint. Then there are some research kind of caching these constraints, right? Like if I have seen it before, not actually on this application, maybe for early application, I solved the constraint before. Now I resolve it on the new application, then I don't need to trigger the expensive constraint solver. I just more like information retrieval problem, database query problem, right? So another work is just saying, okay, rather than exactly see the same constraints, even I have seen similar constraints, not exactly the same, but I could leverage that result to help me to reduce the cost for constraint solving. So there are some recent papers, I'm not going to get into the detail about it. I'm just saying we need more such kind of techniques with this nature of continuous learning. When you apply the techniques uh, along the way, the techniques become smarter. Right? Basically, it's a data-driven way for improvement of the tool rather than just one time and then fix the techniques. So next, I'm going to talk about the second line of research that we have been working on, uh, software analytics. Uh, so what is software analytics? I think nowadays we have seen the terms uh, often the time, right? Uh, Microsoft Research Asia research, uh, researchers and I uh, started uh, this uh, direction. Uh, uh, we define software analytics as uh, 
uh, in a very specific way. I mean, maybe not all the researchers will agree with uh, this definition, but that's what we were pushing or have been pushing. So first, we would say our, we use software analytics basically to help software practitioners, okay? Not just software developers. I think in the past, we have heavy focus on software developers, uh, programmers. And, but in the software company, we have so many different kind of like uh, practitioners, right? You have project managers, you have like uh, UI designers, you have uh, uh, IT supports, I mean, uh, operators, right? I mean, for, for the, the, the DevOps stuff, right? So there's a lot of different people that we could help with and actually need our help. And why we just focus on the and software engineers or the, the programmers? So that's the first point that we want to emphasize. Of course, I mean, this is a data-driven way. I mean, we, we perform data exploring analysis to get insightful and actionable information. Right? Insightful uh, is uh, kind of somewhat difficult to define, right? What is insightful, what is not? But we basically say, I mean, if like, you just look at the data without additional to support, analysis supports, you could just get it by the information. Then we kind of don't consider it as insightful, right? For example, you could just count how many bugs or bug reports being reopened after you close them. Yeah, you could just do simple counting. That's not very insightful. But if you could do some clustering to actually tell people for these reopened bugs, like half of them fall into a particular category due to the same reason. Right? That's more insightful. Normally, you just look at data. You may not easily get it. Actionable information. We are talking about, yes, I mean, yes, scientific discovery. We just want to discover the, the, the nature of the world, right? I mean, we want to find out a lot of interesting phenomena. But how do we use a phenomenon, the discovery, to help change the world, improve the world? That's what we mean, actionable. You could use the information you get and change the world, to so take actions, right? Help the decision making in the software setting and then for data-driven tasks around software and services. So um, we talk about like data-driven, right? I mean, actually we have so many different kinds of data uh, lying around related to software and services. And, and I'm not going to enumerate all of them, but very first category related to software system, more like runtime, right? You collect traces and collect these uh, logs uh, uh, like uh, from the execution. Second one would be more like a oriented for the users, right? User using it, you still collect traces, but they are more for the user perspective. For example, we may monitor how you use PowerPoint, right? Use Microsoft PowerPoint, see which menu you click, right? That's from the user's perspective, not of within the system itself. Right? Uh, there are so many different kind of like uh, text show information, uh, like a bug reports, discussion forum, this kind of thing. Right? So, and the last one is more in the re software development environment, right? You're writing code, you produce code, different versions of code, you have bugs, you have test execution, all different things. More recently, uh, our research community tried to look into this eye checking, right? When you are developing code, what, 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 what portion you are looking at, and also this MRI EMG, right? I mean, to figure out your other symptoms when you're writing code, understanding code. It's still a little bit kind of long-term research there, but maybe in the future we could collect more these sensors, sensing data from the developed environment to know, okay, because you are so angry, you shouldn't write, write that lot of code, right? So maybe you may introduce a, a, a bug into the, the, the software, right? So there's an interesting things going on, right? So overall, basically not really accomplish the goal, right? Really produce practice impact or help people it's not just, I mean, algorithm, it's not just cleaning data. It's across so many different things, right? We need to deal with large-scale data, we need large-scale computing infrastructure, we need good or, or appropriate analysis algorithm design, we also need information visualization and other HCI kind of technique to help the users interact with the information, right? To refine the results in iterations in many situations. Altogether, we want to improve the quality of the software system, the user experiences for the user who are using the software system, and the productivity of the engineers involved in producing the software system. Okay, and uh, with that, I will just throw you uh, several projects. Uh, we already produce a uh, high practice impact within Microsoft, um, like uh, StepMind is a uh, is a major uh, like a uh, system for what we call performance debugging in the large. Right? I think many of you are who are using um, Microsoft operating system, 
you know, like nowadays we don't get a lot of blue screens, right? When you may try to crash your, your operating system, you had the, like a dialogue pointed out, okay, you're going to crash something, right? I mean, are you going to, uh, would you be okay to send some core state traces back to Microsoft? Right? So that's what we call error reporting system. Uh, which has been in place for many years to help improve the reliability of uh, uh, Microsoft operating systems. Here, the state mine is based on another related kind of uh, uh, traces, also called state traces. But it's talking about when you're using uh, uh, like a Microsoft, uh, like a Windows operating system, if you face some performance issues, let's say you open uh, IE 10, you're waiting for five seconds or four seconds, that trigger the detection of performance issues at the client side, right? Then core stack traces will be sent back to Microsoft related to these performance issues. Of course, under the condition when you sign up saying join the program for improving user experiences uh, for Microsoft product, right? So inside, basically, we have a huge number of core stack traces related to performance issues faced by real users. So such that my system is to use frequent pattern mining on such large number of core state traces to group these cases into uh, like a more like buckets so that the same performance issues would be grouped together. Now you could see like, oh, this issue is uh, like a, a, the same issue has been faced by so many users around the world. Not only that, we also need to consider the delay, right? That's what performance is about. Right? If the delay longer on average among so many users facing the problem, then we should give higher priority. So basically, the Windows performance analysis team could use such suggested frequent pattern to guide their debugging investigation to fix this important performance bug early enough to improve the operating system performance. So if you are using uh, Windows 10, you basically are benefit from the system, which is already uh, uh, like has already in place uh, quite some years ago for helping improve performance of uh, Microsoft uh, operating systems like Windows. Second one is Xiao. Uh, I know like Krista's group has been working on clone detection for quite some years. Have a lot of uh, very, very, very uh, effective tools and produce a lot of impact. So this Xiao uh, uh, tool is also clone detection. Uh, if you look at technologies, actually, uh, it's more like building on the, the research achievement of the community, research community for so many years. But uh, we would like to put that into the actual usage in terms of uh, I mean, so many engineers around the world within Microsoft. So one very important interesting insight that we found out is like, this kind of like tunability is very important, right? If like you are using clone detection for refactoring, you may try to uh, kind of make your, your similarity to be pretty high, right? So that, yeah, you miss something, doesn't matter, right? Because you just find some refactoring opportunities. But if you are using this clone search uh, to find bugs, let's say I have one vulnerable code, a uh, piece of code, I want to search many other places including similar or the same vulnerable code, then you don't want to miss I mean, many of them, right? You, are, you can afford to inspect more of these false positive. So your similarity metric would be adjusted to be lower. So adjusting this kind of similarity would be important. So uh, basically, shell system provides this kind of like a careful design on the metric, similarity metric, and also UI to interact with user, a lot of other things that uh, I mean, would be important, but not really heavily focused uh, 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 in the past. So the, uh, the tool has already been released and <laughs> we are still the 2000, since 2012, of course, nowadays, 2017, 15, already has it. You could search within your solution, okay? You still cannot search across multiple solutions, that's by design. Right? Uh, by the product because Vue Studio is more like solution or, or project based uh, like environment. Uh, it also uh, being used as an internal uh, like a, a Microsoft security research, uh, security response center. Basically it's more like central unit within Microsoft to deal with uh, security issues, security vulnerabilities. So for every security vulnerability being uh, like uh, uh, received at the center, the security engineers use such as a clone search engine to search whole Microsoft code bases to find out similar vulnerabilities, right? So that they release a patch to patch so many different places corresponding to the same vulnerability, right? So, so these are the cases uh, to, to really push uh, the clone detection or clone uh, search research 
been produced by the research community for so many years, really put into the hands of the engineers and the society. The next one is more related to the nowadays, the modern system, right? Uh, online services, right? Distributed systems. As we know, for such systems, if something bad happens, it's very difficult to reduce those, those uh, bad symptoms uh, uh, you observe. Uh, but at the same time, because uh, online services need to be up, I mean, 24 7, right? any downtime will cause the company big money. So uh, basically, we need to have this more like health monitor on the side to help us to keep the service up running. So uh, Microsoft Asia developed this service analysis studio. Uh, uh, like for several of these projects, I have this uh, link to the related papers. Uh, you could uh, dig out more details there. Uh, so basically here we use uh, transaction logs being produced for the execution of the, 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 the source code, along with uh, system metric like the CPU usage, etc. Uh, and to do this uh, more like a, a, a service uh, a healing process, for example, if like my laptop, if like getting very slow, what do I do? I don't go ahead to really debug the binary you know, resistor, right? You restart the machine. Okay. Similar thing could happen in an online service distributed system, right? But the key problem is that which machine would you start if you get have some performance issue or crashing, right? And and, and so so like any mistake being made in terms of making the wrong assumption on what action you want to take to heal the system could really cause the company big money. So we had this uh, uh, like a data mining, machine learning solution to suggest the healing action based on the past history on the healing actions being, uh, being used to heal the past similar issues being encountered. So um, as we know, I mean, for the several projects, especially the online service distribution system, it's very difficult to carry out for our academic researchers, right? Uh, for another related kind of technologies, microservices. Um, industry uh, is probably adopting such microservices, but it's suffering a lot of pain on debugging and testing because more or less it's like splitting this original service into smaller services. Right? Maybe one engineer would be in charge of one service, very small feature. Right? When you have one service coming, sending over, let's say you send a message to your friend in Facebook Messenger, that particular action service would trigger so many microservices being involved. Behind the scene, so we, we see around industries really pay high attention. But I mean, if you see our major conferences, ICFSC or ISTA, almost no papers on that, right? One of the reasons we found out is that it could be like we really don't have the test bed to allow researchers to really evaluate their new techniques. So together with uh, uh, Fudan University researchers from China, uh, we developed this uh, median size open source uh, microservice system more like benchmark system, uh, to realize a feature for booking train tickets and allow uh, like, uh, uh, people to, to order like, uh, tickets like in the normal setting. Right? So we also include some four cases being uh, replicated from real force from our industry partners' uh, microservice system. So this is uh, getting a lot of attention from, from different companies because Indeed, but right, we don't have reasonable size of the microservices system to allow research or other companies to jump in to help you. So now we had uh, uh, more than 70 microservices in this system, more than uh, 40 business logic related microservices. Right? I encourage uh, some of you may look into I know that Jim Jones group is looking at testing microservices. I think this is a very good uh, test bed and benchmark for many researchers to really uh, leverage that to carry out more progress in this space of uh, microservice uh, uh, research, which is a serious lacking but industry in a desperate need uh, for, for more research. So get back to the, the top intelligence, right? I mean, how do, how do really have intelligence in IDE? Right? So here's uh, like the typical Visual Studio IDE, right? I mean, just like similar to Eclipse and many other, other language. Um, so, my vision is that in the future, we may have these natural language interfaces with the, the, the IDE. Right? Of course, some of you may argue, right? I mean, we are just so, so hacky and nerdy, we just want to type in code. I right? don't want to use uh, natural language. It may happen, right? So, as I said, it's just a vision that we would like to push. Uh, I think it would be a tricky balance. Some of the tasks we may engage still 
I mean, some of you may just use UBI, right? Using command lines. I mean, that's totally natural, right? But for some of the tasks or some other uh, developers, we may have this natural language interface. So we don't have that yet. I mean, in a lot. I mean, we see Slack and along with other, we have bots to allow you to engage this natural language dialogue. So here is a, a, a setting, more like natural language interfacing in more like data analytic tasks. Right? So this scenario is from uh, our collaborators at Microsoft Research Asia. So they are saying in a mobile setting, right? I mean, if I want to do some pro, uh, data analytics, I don't go in and type in my SQL statement, right? I may just say, okay, have this bot talking to, to, to you and say, uh, like, uh, uh, please show me the sales of a luxury car, right? Because it's a car sales database uh, table. But the bot, I mean, does not really understand luxury car because the table does not have any column or value of luxury car. It's more like domino in user's mind. So the bot will further clarify with the user, okay, what do you mean by luxury car? Oh, then the tool, the bot, no, oh, like actually, like uh, the, 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 luxury, uh, the, the user will say, oh, the luxury car would be 50K US dollar, more or more, right, the, the sales price. Then the, 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 the bot or the tool all knows what, what the users mean. Then we just show the, the statistic that we are saying. Keep in mind here, there's a lot of uh, like uh, underlying intelligence solution. Figure out what analysis you want, right? The details on what sales information, sales statistics you really want based on the user history, based on the nature of the data, etc. And what visualization you want. So you see, there's a lot of decision making, the data mining, machine learning in the back end already make for you, rather than you have to tell exactly how. It's more like you just tell, tell the system what you want, even you don't need to say precisely what you want. Right? So I think that's something we may want to see in our future IDE or software development environment. Okay? Due to a time limit, I'm not going to talk about this project. And basically, it's talking about from the environment, we uh, further uh, develop some like, uh, 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 reinforcement learning for improving existing deep learning solutions, for translating natural language for describing regular expression to regular expression. Okay? Uh, if you're interested, you could look at our ENNLP uh, paper this year. So I'm going to uh, jump in into the second direction, like uh, intelligence software engineering, and just show you some problems with a little bit solutions uh, like uh, proposed by both the AI communities and our software engineering community. So as we know, like uh, uh, the automatic uh, self-driving cars, I mean, it's getting a lot of attention and adoption, right? Uh, um, but uh, the reliability, dependability is still a big problem, right? So here is about a famous, uh, like a, a like a accident, an unfortunate accident, on like a, the uh, Tesla car uh, hitting uh, like a, a truck, the, the, the side of the truck, because the Tesla couldn't know there's a truck in front of uh, the car thinking like that white color of the the side of the truck would be the sky right it's the, the kind of like no obstacles uh, um, so more recent one is like the the uber self-driving car right hitting the pedestrians and there's a more recent news talking about the reason it's talking about like behind the scene one layer after another in terms of the decision making and the logic about making decision in the end no engineer, no engineer know what's going on about what the code is doing, right? It's kind of ad hoc for you to really kind of do a testing or, or trusting the, the such important usage of the AI solution. Here's a kind of not safety code, but really causing a lot of the social uh, uh, side effects, right? I mean, Microsoft Research uh, pay uh, checkbox at, at Twitter, uh, being open for 24 hours, and then have to be shut down. Right, because uh, a lot of these so-called malicious or, or not good intention to the user interact with the bot and then in the end the bot becomes uh, the, the, the like a uh, genocidal racism right I mean uh, race, racist uh, talking about a lot of these uh, uh, very inappropriate uh, sentences in, in tweets right they have to shut it down so if we talk about some of the discussion actually it's somewhat related to our software engineering issues right talking about I mean sufficient testing right even talking about requirements engineering, what do you mean the, the expected behavior of such bot, right? How do you define the boundaries and appropriate and not appropriate? Because if you just limit too much on what the bot can hear or can say, then you lose the, 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 the kind of naturalness, right? The human-like behavior, 
right? So it's it's a kind of wide open issues in terms of uh, the software engine perspective. So here's another tool, right? And and from Amazon, they would like to improve their recruitment by uh, like uh, adopt, deploying AI tools to really scan engineers, uh, Amazon engineers resumes and then go out in the internet to crawl these different resumes and more like identify those resumes that would be similar to uh, existing Amazon engineers resume, right? I mean, hopefully, I mean, such candidates would really be the one that they are looking for, right? Uh, as you can imagine, uh, like uh, Amazon engineers would be uh, male dominated, right? I mean, primary male engineers. And, and this AI tool becomes more like a, a sexism, right? I mean, like, uh, just filter out females' resumes. Uh, uh, in the end, Amazon had to stop, I mean, this uh, uh, usage of the tool. Actually, it's, it was not that Amazon did not pay attention to such issue. They, when they started the, the project and deployed the tool, they already paid attention to such issue. But because it's such a difficult issue to address, in the end, they still cannot prevent such issues from happening. So uh, as some of you know, like uh, some researchers from our software engineering area already make some progress in this more like fairness testing, right? Do we see like our software system based on machine learning have this discrimination nature, right? Uh, but it's still kind of just the beginning. We need more research in this space. So another uh, topic is on uh, the virtual machine learning. Uh, basically, it's talking about on the right hand, left hand side, we have a school bus image, right? This kind of like a AI solution for recognizing objects in the image. We say, oh, there's school bus there, right? You label that as the predictive label for your classification. Right? The, the virtual machine learning is saying that, okay, now I carefully uh, craft certain noise and overlay the noise on this original image so that we produce a right-hand side image. So for human, we could still identify, oh, that's of course still a school bus. Right? But uh, the, the machine learner, the classifier, was, oh, that's an uh, ostrich. Right? So um, actually, many of these machine learners are pretty easy to fool. Right? I mean, think about uh, using face recognition and whatnot. You could easily fool this face recognition by wearing some specific masks with certain color. Right? And, and, um, so um, in the operating system area and software engineering area, we see some progress in terms of uh, testing such a deep learning system. For example, uh, you add a little bit kind of so-called noise and you could mislead the, uh, the driver, I mean the automatic uh, like a driving decision making saying that if you make it darker, right, then originally uh, the correct decision should be turning left, but if you make it darker, it just turning right and then cause accidents. Right? So uh, this kind of like a, a classifier are really not robust enough. So here are some more examples, uh, like uh, adding some fox, adding some rains, I mean, make it lighter, and you could easily fool this kind of like uh, classifier. Right? So one thing is that there's another direction, it's called physical, this kind of the virtual machine learning. It's talking about for the road side, I just add certain pictures there, whatever, add some color blocking in human, you can see, oh, that's still stop sign. But research found out if you add some stuff there, and you could mislead the classifier, the, the self-driving car may consider that's a speeding limit, which could cause accident, right? I mean, if like, you don't stop, if there's another car coming over for malicious user, it could cause problem. But my colleague in our department, Illinois, uh, uh, found out, actually, don't panic, right? So, uh, like a, a lot of these so-called like, uh, uh, proposed attacks, they are under very limited assumptions. Uh, basically, they say, uh, if basically uh, uh, my colleague, uh, his, his student, actually put this kind of like modified size on the real stop sign and actually driving a car with this self driving like camera, whatever this UN system, and, and see whether actually such kind of like a, a the virtual image could fool the, the decision making. Actually, they found out no. Why? Because this existing attack change the image that require your classifier, your camera, to be on a specific angle to be full, okay? And in specific distance to be full. If you are driving your car because you are continuously getting the image inside, right? When you have enough image, yeah, majority voting, you don't get full. Right? 
right? So that's uh, the, the high-level message. But of course, I mean, one thing that we shouldn't be panicking, uh, shouldn't panic about, uh, be panicking about it, but at the same time, we should make more progress because indeed, this classifier are really not robust enough. Right? So that's one thing, I just uh, talk about this and then I will wrap up, and basically, neural machine translation is another, like, uh, uh, like not that robust, uh, like, functionality. Uh, neural machine translation here is using neural network deep learning to help translation rather than statistical translation, which is based on statistics or statistical analysis. And this is an example uh, from Google back in uh, like uh, April this year. Uh, in the, on the internet, there was some discussion joking about it. Basically, uh, for those who can recognize Chinese, left hand side, uh, the top is talking about uh, Tsinghua University is not as good as <coughs> Peking University. Okay? Near the top, it's the opposite. It's talking about Peking University is not as good as Tsinghua University. I, I got my master from Peking University. My brother got uh, his a bachelor from Tsinghua University, so we kind of like a little competition between our siblings. So basically, right hand side, Google Translate all translated as a Tsinghua University is not as good as Peking University. So, uh, like a joke with my brother, but I said, oh, maybe the engineer developing this at Google would be uh, a graduate from Peking University. But the reality is that uh, uh, this kind of neural machine translation would be easily uh, making a mistake. Uh, so with uh, the WeChat group I mentioned, like from Tencent, we basically we develop this uh, new like uh, testing or or monitoring techniques to detect such uh, uh, in uh, like a suspicious or, or faulty cases at runtime when you don't even have the ground truth, right? We are just live translating sentences. How do we detect there are some like uh, issues in this translated results? So we use that technique to improve the translation services at, at WeChat and then substantially improve the accuracy and along with some detecting issue from other uh, neural translation services. With that, I will just uh, uh, conclude by saying that, yeah, the research community is putting efforts into this direction. Not only operating system, software engineering, programming language, also security, right? Uh, the virtual machine learning is actually one very important hot topic for uh, security. Uh, this is a very large project from, uh, like led by uh, NSF project led by Penn State on trustworthy machine learning, right? investing on uh, techniques for improving the dependability or trustworthiness of machine learning system. Uh, with that, I think like uh, uh, I've just concluded, I talk about two directions, both are very important, and, and not only like making advances in academia for academic research impact, we also see a lot of opportunities for making impacts on practice. Uh, um, I think it's important across area, AI, programming language, operating systems, software engineering, all together, we, we can help. I mean, AI, all use AI to help us. Okay, thank you very much.